the Electoral College. How did we get here? Uh, well, okay. Right. So, uh, <laughs> no. Most Americans cast their vote and they think it's for the president. president right. Who are they actually voting for? They're, Who are we actually voting they're for? They're actually voting for a slate of electors right. who are pledged to, in turn, vote for that particular candidate. Right. And if your candidate wins that state, you will send a slate of electors uh, who will be the people who are responsible for making sure that your person actually achieves the office that they have been elected to. 90% of our audience just said, what the f***? I know, right? <laughs> we are the only place in the world that has this system. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Nobody else around the world understands it. Most of us in this country don't understand it. Right. And so it's one of those kind of peculiarities of American politics. Why do we have it? What's one of the big reasons we have it? Uh, so one of the reasons that we have, the really fundamental reason we have it, is to balance out the political power of large states and smaller states. Now, that's a generic answer. Yes. The real answer yes. is that it was a means by which slaveholders would be able to use the bodies of the people they were holding in slavery right. to count in the census in order to give them additional political power. Because the, the Constitution also has the three-fifths clause, which allows them to count 60% of the enslaved population. In 1860, that meant 2.4 million people right. who were enslaved right. were counted in the census when you determined how much congressional representation the South would have. Now, bear in mind, this is a country that owes its existence right. to a war fought over the idea of no taxation without representation. Right. Slaves cannot vote. Right. But the four million people who are enslaved in the South are counted in part in, as part of the political system that gives the authority to Southern voters. Is contradiction too soft of a word? Uh, <laughs> I think hypocrisy, hypocrisy is probably a better word. Yeah. Uh, watching the documentary, hearing you talk about it, I, 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 I vaguely remembered some of this. Mm -hmm. But man, is it powerful to relearn mm -hmm. and besides watching this, how, how can we relearn this stuff? How should we be approaching voting knowing this? So, I mean, one, we should be educated about this. There's a lot of literature on it. There's, yeah. you know, I mean, it sounds not that interesting, yeah. but when you actually look at the way that the story plays out, it becomes immensely interesting. Correct, yeah. The biggest political conflicts that we've had in this country's history have been around the Electoral College, right. you know, some of them. Uh, certainly, it factors into the politics that lead to the Civil War. Yep. Uh, it factors into the explosive election of 1876. Uh, many of us are old enough to remember all of the conflict of the election of 2000. Yeah. Uh, we saw the Electoral College popular, co popular vote split in 2016 and all the uh, attention that we got out of that. And so it really is, even though it sounds abstract and complicated and kind of ridiculous, yeah. it really is something that has the potential to affect your lives every time you go into the ballot booth and cast that ballot. I think the movie did a great job at making me feel like history was affecting me today. Sure. What are the barriers to changing the Electoral College? Why don't we or can't we just have a national popular vote? Well, there's an attempt to have a national popular vote. Solve all of our problems right now. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I, I realize this is a big burden to put on you, but you know more about it than me and everyone else. So, I mean, you're here but to... there, there are much smaller political problems yeah. that we have not summoned the will to address. Right, right. Or I should say much more direct and kind of fundamental problems. Uh, we haven't summoned the will to address those things. And so with the Electoral College, one of the big barriers is explaining to people why we need right. to do something about it. <laughs> because we say, oh, well, this goes uh, back to 1787, and yeah. we've had the same system, and yeah. we've done pretty well in the world since then, and so why would we change? Yeah. Uh, as opposed to saying, we might need to avert a potential catastrophe on the horizon because yeah. this system has never really served us well. The more we know about this country and our government, the better, right? Absolutely. Right? The history? Absolutely. Right. Okay, good. Just I wanted every teacher to hear that, every kid who's like, I don't want to go to civics. I was talking to you backstage, but I was actually, you know, watching this and, and reading more about it, I was actually kind of proud that growing up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, I had some understanding of this. But, man, we should all have way more understanding of this. We should. Yeah. I mean, because we talked about this. I grew up in New York. And yeah. I went to New York City Public Schools where I got an excellent education. Yeah. But we did not get 
you know, the particular political implications of the Electoral College. We weren't yeah. taught that. We certainly were not taught that this was rooted in slavery. Right. Uh, and right. an attempt to use slaves for political leverage. Yeah. Uh, and so those were things that, if I didn't know it, and many other people didn't know it, uh, it makes it that much difficult, more difficult for us to understand why it's important now. And it's yeah, and it's important to to understand that because it's easy. It, it makes it easier to make it affect change. If sure. that's the, one of the foundations for this, I think we all can agree we should be changing that. Let's switch gears. Um, you're the dean of the Columbia Journalism School. Mm -hmm. What does the average American not understand about news, trustworthy news, trustworthy journalism? I think that because people don't understand the process and the methodology of reporting yes. uh, and journalism, it's easy to believe that we just kind of go back to our cubicles and make stuff up. Right. Um, or that we walk into the room and we say like, uh, who do we, who right. do we want to win the debate? Right. Uh, we decide that Vance won the debate, okay, that's what we're gonna go with. Right. Um, but really, there's a lot of work that goes into everything that we do um, that it, it requires a great deal of skill and craft uh, to be able to go into an environment that you may or may not be familiar with, to find out what's going on, to interview people who may be reluctant to talk to you, to get facts, uh, and then turn those facts into something that people can consume. Right. Uh, you have editors, you have fact checkers, you have copy editors, that we really do work very hard at producing the information that we have, and that there is a difference between the information that you can get from a vetted, qualified source right. and what you may get from just a random guy's YouTube station. And so... You know, we um, have got a lot of YouTubers in the audience. Yeah, I mean, um, no, no offense. You know, I would assume, because this is how it works with, with jokes on a comedy show, is that if some, you sometimes go down a path mm -hmm. and if things aren't checking out, you can't write the story. Yep. That, that's also part of it. That's absolutely Killing true. stories. Yeah, there's not a one-to-one -one ratio right. uh, between, and that's one of the reasons why reporting uh, and journalism is so expensive. You can spend right. three months on a story and then come to the conclusion that there's nothing there. Right. Uh, now, you have learned something. So, you know, I've known people who have done stories where they thought that an elected official was corrupt, uh, and you spent a whole lot of time, and then you said, no. No, guy's not correct. Right, right. You can't do a story saying <laughs> news, newsflash. Right. You know, Congressman right. Johnson is not on the take. You right. know, <laughs> that's right. not that's not a news story. But it is important information that you've learned. You know, in the course of doing that, uh, and so you keep doing that. And and who knows what the ratio is for right. you know when you get to an actual story. So what do you tell your students who? A lot of people, especially young people, but a lot of people are getting their news from YouTube, are getting their news from TikTok. Mm -hmm. This is not, these aren't vetted sources, these aren't facts. I mean, w w what do you tell them to, where do they, where should they get their news? Well, I mean, I think that it's healthy to have a really kind of diversified news diet, you know, and if you were Ooh, going to... I like to, that. Yeah. Diversified yeah, news like, diet. Yeah. Yeah. And so you want, I, I have another one. Okay, say, please. Like, news organizations. <laughs> We are the health food store surrounded by fast food joints. Correct, yes. You know, and right. we're trying to actually get people to have the more healthy diet. Now, you can certainly go to your YouTube guy uh, for opinion. Right. Uh, or you can go to these other places. But right. we should also say that, you know, maybe you go to, you know, a public uh, news station. Maybe you go to a nonprofit uh, news right. uh, outlet. Maybe you go to a legacy organization. Uh, maybe you go to some podcasts. You kind of yeah. mix these things up. And you should be taking in information from lots of different places and coming to your own conclusions. I love the analogy of a diet of... <laughs> We have health food, we have junk food, we have healthy news, we have junk news, but the problem is this country and its diet. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm worried that people are, I mean, look, I scroll on TikTok and I feel my brain begin to rot. Mm. And then I choose to read an article in New Yorker and I feel my brain, you know, trying to absorb more information. So I know what's good for me. Mm -hmm. But am I doing it? Well, well, the other part. Am of I it, doing it, Jolan? No, it's like <laughs> it's hard. It's harder to do the right thing. It is, but yeah. also I think it's important for us to be on TikTok too. You know, right. Maybe I like we, that. Maybe we bring health food to your door, so you know we will right. meet you where you are. <laughs> what is good in the news right now? 
not necessarily the stories, but in the idea of journalism and news, what, what is a positive that you see? You know, a real positive is that we have lots of people who each day, despite all the difficulties, despite all the discouragement and, you know, even some of the distrust, we have people who every day wake up and go out and report. Yeah. Uh, and we have a dedicated core of journalists in this country, people who even believe that the public's perception, the public being informed, is more important than their own safety. Wow. Uh, and that's something that I never take that's, for granted. That's and thank God we have those people. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for thank talking you. with us. One person, one vote is now available to stream on the PBS app. Jelani Cobb, everybody.